YouTube in the house. Let's see. Yep. I'm double checking because the live stream before this last one was not bueno. It's not that it was not bueno. It's that we had some interruption. And then the last one, it just completely froze. So I had to like start over and then make last episode into two episodes, which was super annoying. But this episode is going to be great. We're not going to have any issues. I'm convinced. I'm going to give it a few minutes, not a few minutes, a few seconds for people to get on. I know it's a later episode today. Um, it's 3.30 in the afternoon. I didn't get it all the way finished this morning. Went on a little bit of a deep dive into the 11 Madison Park story, but we're going to go into that in a little bit of a moment. Hope everyone's having a great Monday. Let's see where my levels are here. Turn it down. There, that's... I don't know why I'm pretending like you can hear this, because only I can hear it. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Hello, hello to everyone that's in the live stream. <clears throat> Let's just get it started, shall we? What is up, folks? Justin Kana here. Today on the Emulsion Podcast, we talk all about 11 Madison Park reopening, Momofuku's change of concept, and a culinary school class all about Instagram photos. Coming up. Welcome back to the show, folks. This is episode 34 of The Emulsion. We are live on YouTube right now. If you're awesome enough to be subscribed and to have notifications turned on, this is where you start to join this lovely live stream of ours. This is where you get to be involved in the conversation, and I suggest you do that because I want your opinions. I want your perspectives and your questions. This is what makes this show great is you folks. If you aren't on YouTube or if you're listening to this after the live stream, go ahead and tweet at me if you aren't listening live at Justin underscore Kana and hashtag the emulsion so I can find you. Today's beverage is some Hawaiian coffee. This is a Kona, Kona brew. Um, I made this as a cold brew. Check out this mug. Isn't this beautiful? Only the live stream people can see this, unfortunately. This is a uh, Natasha Alfonsi mug. She's a local Seattle artist. I attended her open house this past week. And my girlfriend actually picked up this beautiful handleless mug. She fires this mug for five consecutive days, like five full days at like 1200 degrees in a kiln. And it's just, it's beautiful. Um, I also picked up some plates from her for our ready pop up. So I'm super pumped to put some food on those. But right now, I just have her coffee. She's not a sponsor for this, for anyone who's probably concerned about that. I just wanted to give her a shout out because she's small and still. What's up, Evan? And she just makes really great stuff. She wants to get more involved into restaurants. So if you need plates or you know of anyone who needs some custom ceramics, she's a great person to get in contact with. Go ahead and shoot me a message anywhere and I will make sure you two get in contact. Um, she's also tagged in my Instagram story today if you want to check her out, out, any of her stuff out online. But let's get into the news, shall we? The first story of the day has to be all about the news this week and almost specifically yesterday about 11 Madison Park. Uh, yes, they have been huge in the news for multiple reasons this past week, and we're going to talk about all of them. So first up, this actually comes from Joshua. He actually gave me a heads up on this story. The guys over at 11 Madison Park just randomly decided to drop a cookbook, uh, and not just a run-of-the-mill cookbook, but a, like a super rare limited edition book with only 11,000 copies. Uh, so the current best restaurant in the world just randomly decided to drop this. There was no hype. There was no trailer. There was no, like, coming out soon, like, pre-order. They just dropped it, and it, it, it's you, you can literally buy it right now. Um, but why 11,000 copies? Why that specific number? Well, the idea of this book is to, quote, preserve the last 11 years of 11 Madison Park and imagine the next 11, end quote. That's so cute. Uh -huh. So how much does it cost and why is there only 11,000 copies? So Eater has it listed for $250, uh, but through a quick little click through Amazon, it's already on sale. So you can already get it for $206.73. That is the current price that I'm actually able to get it for. And I can literally Amazon Prime it to my house by tomorrow. So they're definitely still in stock. They're not like hard to come by or you need to like bid for them on eBay right now. Every single copy is supposedly signed by Daniel Hume and Will Godara. Uh, it's divided into two sections. It's two different volumes, so stories and recipes. 
Those are the two different sections of the book. The first volume is a memoir of uh, Chef Hume's culinary coming of age with personal reflections, lessons learned, and stories of signature dishes. Hume's memoirs are written in vignettes, which correspond to the recipes in volume two, next to illustrations by Janice Barnes, who is a longtime staffer at the restaurant with a knack for the watercolor palette. Uh, and that's all coming from Eater's article. So the second volume is 100 recipes organized by season. And for anyone who's familiar with the first 11 Madison Park book, it, that book was exactly the same. So um, that to me was super, super interesting. If you love those Daniel Hume classics, that, I mean, this book has got to be a recommendation uh, for me. If you like his food, if you enjoyed his kind of style and presentation, you probably should definitely pick it up. Is it worth the 250 bucks? Maybe if if you're a longtime fan of the restaurant and you're you're you, like a signed copy of that kind of stuff does it for you, I would 100% recommend that you pick it up. But if you've ever wanted to get a kind of a peek into how three Michelin starred restaurants do their purees and their sauces and construct a dish, it's actually it's absolutely a textbook for that, right? Because um, they document it really well. The photography is really good, and they actually break down the recipes really well. I've stolen a couple recipes from the first 11 Madison Park book. I don't actually have that book on my shelf, but uh, I've creeped on it at a couple of friends' houses. And it, it's, it's definitely a good book. There's a lot of good inspiration to be had from that, from that book. Will I be picking one up? Maybe. Shout out to my cookbook club on Patreon. That's happening. Maybe if we make it through my whole bookshelf and they're still on sam sale on Amazon, I'll make it. I'll, 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 I'll try to make that, that book review happen. But right now I'm currently rifling through Le Livre Blanc by Anne-Sophie Pick, another uh, Michelin star restaurant out of France. If you don't know what the cookbook club is, for as little as $1 a month, you can support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Justin Kana, quick shameless plug there. Um, I release my notes and my recipes and my stories on cookbooks, um, as well as my own practical chef advice. And then at the end, I give the cookbook away. So if you're in the mood for a cookbook, that's definitely a good super fun video series for me and hopefully super valuable for you folks. So all of that cookbook news was super smart, whether or not the timing was actually the way that they made it happen or if it was just a media stunt. Uh, they managed to get it announced just before the restaurant reopened from renovations yesterday. So it's Monday, they, uh, they, they reopened on Sunday. Luckily, the photographer Evan Sung and Grub Street crushed out a story on it so I can cover it here on this Monday uh, afternoon. So a huge part of this article is all about Daniel Hume and his philosophy. More on that later, but for now, let's just talk about the food. Layers, man. Everything on this menu is shingled, uh, or at least from the photos that they've posted. I can only imagine giving a deck of cards to any of the chefs at 11 Madison Park and just watching them deal it out super fast. Just I, just to give you that the numbers, at the 25 dishes that are posted, I guess there's 24 because one of them is a duplicate of a previous dish but there's 24 dishes 11 of them have this element of like shingled layers to them and my question is is that a signature move or is that kind of like a trend that we're going through right now with plating we've seen this before it's not it, it, i don't know if it can be his his own signature move but it to me that plating style signifies detail and generosity and uniformity which is all something that you pay for essentially when you're going to these places but um it, it's a great way to present layers because most of these shingled dishes have an element below them where you kind of discover the dish as you eat it. Um, it's a component that I never quite realized until I had a meal at Noma two years ago where a lot of the dishes are served like this. They took a step um, further actually to serve the dishes in bowls. So the underlying idea here is not to just have a beautiful presentation, but to make sure that the guest is able to get a very calculated bite. And that's something that I really wanted to talk about and, and, and dive deeper into because um, you as a chef have, have a huge amount of control in the type of the bite that the person has when you plate food like that. You want to make it super easy for your guest to kind of get the bite that you as the chef want them to eat. We've seen other styles of plating where we've all seen it, right? The, the styles of plating where you have like seven component dishes with garnishes and kind of like odd numbers all over the plate. You make little triangles with your garnish. Um, but who's to say that an uninitiated, uninitiated diner, even an educated one, will get the bite that you want them to have if you kind of plate your food like that? The style of plating solves that problem while still making sure that there's an aesthetic to it. Because you can't serve a, a complete pile of food or mix everything together. This makes it so that there's separations, but 
you are forced to kind of dig into every single bite and make sure that every single bite is the same. So Chef Moom has also claimed a, quote, hyper-minimal style of plating that's very clear to him. Uh, a lot of the photos in this book are on clear white backgrounds. He doesn't tend to have his food need to have fancy plates or any sort of different presentations, even though a lot of his food has an element of show to it. So they'll use the Garridon, the little cart that they roll through the dining room to present a lot of these dishes, but hyper minimal is the style that the article is quoting. And he even said it himself, quote, eight years ago, if you looked at some of my food, it looked like it took 20 chefs to put it together with tweezers. Today, it still might take 20 chefs, but I don't want that to show. I want it all to be much more accessible. What are your guys' thoughts on that? That's kind of an interesting point. Uh, that's very, very Noma thing to say because a lot of the dishes at Noma as well are, are, are very similar like that. If you've seen any of the tarts that they make or a lot of the desserts that they make as well, it has that element to it for sure. Quick cold brew sip. So we've got the food under control, but there's so many other ideas I wanna make sure that I'm highlighting in this article specifically that really rung true to me. And those were in order, documenting, cooking food that you love, choice, and signature dishes. So those four we're going to dive deep into. And those are all things that I kind of surfaced um, from, from, from this article. So Evan asks, simple is the new trend then? I would say that we're kind of at a weird polarizing point right now, where simple is has been a trend for a while, and it's something that kind of surfaced. Um, I would probably say either when the modernist movement became a thing, where, you know, people would say, oh, that was the best bite I ever had. And all it was was a spherified olive, right? That really flipped in everybody's mind where it's like, it doesn't have to be this big elaborate dish. You have to have an element of surprise to it. And that, again, once the modernist movement kind of like fizzled out a little bit, transformed into a thing where it was all about highlighting the product, right? So now you have people like Magnus Nielsen at Fabikin who would say, all I want to do is serve this crab leg and butter, and that's it. Those are the only two things are, in his case, I think it's like burnt cream, almost burnt cream. So you have this style of plating where it's literally just a piece of protein and then a small pool or dollop of sauce. And that was a very, very interesting point. And you can see that a lot in, in Daniel Holmes' food at 11 Madison Park. I would say that there's also a, it goes the other way, right? Where you can make something that's so incredibly complex. I think it depends on the appreciation that you have for it. If, if I am very, very impressed by a perfectly cooked piece of crab with a amazingly calculated burnt cream next to it, but then, you know, the other cook that I work with, uh, he's had some gripes where he thinks that a course is, should not be considered a course if you have just a, an oyster that's shucked with a little bit of garnish on it. That's not considered a course. So to each their own, I, I, I would say that it's an interesting trend that we're definitely going through right now. Um, I definitely tr try to make my food along the more simple side and me and that other cook that I work with kind of grapple with it sometimes because I want it to be simple and I want it to be like an insanely well executed food that doesn't need a ton of components. But at the same time, because there's something nice in being able to say, this is just a perfect piece of duck, enjoy. But at the same time, it's fun to play with different textures and temperatures and all of that. So back to those things that we were gonna dive a little bit deeper into, the first one was documenting. So he says in an article, quote, <clears throat> early on, like 10 years ago, I wished that somehow more people were watching what we were doing. But looking back, that was the best thing because you could put something on the menu and if it wasn't perfect, you wanted to make changes you could take it off two days later and no one would even know about it, end quote. And this is something that he references now where he says every single new dish that we put out, every, every person's eyes are going to be on it, which I thought was super interesting because it's true. But coming from me, someone who's documenting a lot, I got to say it's really hard. <laughs> it, th there's not a ton of exciting stuff happening right now for me. I mean, to me. It's exciting, that's why I started vlogging again, but how cool would it be to be able to point to videos or photos from 11 Madison Park from 10 years ago, right? We would all be watching those, those videos. But that would, make the art, that would also make the stories in this article that much more powerful and provide a real sense of what it was like to build something from, I mean, essentially nothing, 
for, to, from nothing to what 11 Madison Park is today. The problem is it's hard to justify showing that kind of vulnerability, especially as a chef. Everybody wants to show it off when it's ready, right? It's, it's really, really hard to show off the raw, unfinished product. I literally said it in my interview with uh, Chef Chris Hill the other week. If any of you caught that live stream, that was very, very beneficial and interesting. I wish I had footage of me from me staging and cooking and going to culinary school, but there's zero. There's no footage from that. I kept my head down and I worked the entire time, but now I wish I had it. And I don't want that feeling again for this chapter in my life. So that's why I'm documenting for everyone that's interested in why I'm doing the vlogs that I'm doing and posting this emulsion podcast and sharing my thoughts and all of it. The lesson here is don't worry about what people think. If you want the memories, make them uh, because life is short. So the next point that I want to dive into is, is cooking food that you love. And this is another conversation that I've had with multiple people. Everybody knows that Daniel Hume is Swiss, right? And, and here he is doing in New York City, doing a New York City inspired tasting menu and he crushes it. And no one asks, why isn't Daniel Hume doing Swiss food, right? He truly loves New York and wants to tell that story through food. And again, I had a talk with a friend the other day about getting permission to serve certain things or cook in a certain way. And I'm trying to explore it because would, would a born and bred New Yorker serve the same tasting menu better? I, I'm not 100% sure. I'd like to, I think people like um, Ivan Orkin at Ivan Ramen or Rick Bayless in Chicago. I think of those people when I think of these arguments because to me it comes down to how much you love the food and how capable you are to tell that story. I just wanted to remark on that because there aren't rules like that. And if you like, if you if you flaunt it and you don't got it, it's gonna fail. But if you truly like from the bottom of your heart love Nepalese food, but you're Italian, I think you should cook Nepalese food. That's just my thoughts. The next aspect that I drew from the article is all about choice. And the menu at 11 Madison Park, even when I ate there last September, had choice involved. It still does. And what happens is when you sit down, they ask you at the start of the meal for a certain number of courses, you get a choice. So for example, in this article, they, re they referenced you can, when you have, when you are getting presented the foie gras dish, you get the choice of having it in, in one of two ways. You can even either have it hot with beets or cold with cabbage. You also get three choices for the main course, duck, veal, or celery root. And again, this is back to the kind of exuding luxury aspect of, you know, that's uh, that I mentioned that's almost reminiscent of the old school French style restaurants of back in the day in New York City, where yes, there is a set menu, but we are so hospitable that you get to choose what you like. And it's kind of a way to show off the skill of the kitchen at the same time. It's also an opportunity for people like me uh, to give the to kind of do the one in one if I'm eating with someone else and then we do the plate swap halfway through. That's my favorite move. And I'm sure some of you do it as well. But it's one of my favorite ways to eat, especially when they get when they give a choice. Uh, it might not be the kitchen's favorite, uh, especially being in the kitchen. It, it, it's definitely not our favorite or it's not not our favorite. We just prefer it when you order two of the same main course. I guess that, that's what I should say. So the next point that I want to talk about is also on the dish end of the spectrum, and that's all about signature dishes. So contrary to what all of us think and what all of us want to believe about ourselves as chefs, there is inherently a power in a signature dish. I hated the idea of it growing up because I equated it to a band, right? Like everyone loves the Rolling Stones because the second that they go on stage, everyone wants to hear satisfaction, but then the Rolling Stones as musicians get put in this box and then they have to play the same damn song every show. And sometimes as chefs, we feel like that. We don't want to kind of get a signature dish because we always want to be creating, constantly coming up with new things. However, now that I'm on my own, doing my own food, people ask me all the time, oh, what's your specialty? I'm sure you've gotten the same question as a chef. Daniel Hume can say, my specialty is honey lavender duck and black and white cookies and celery root cooked in a pig's bladder with truffles. And Thomas Keller can say salmon cornets and oysters and pearls. And Grant Atkins can say black truffle explosion and green apple balloons. People like having something to reference. And I think that's super powerful, something to look forward to. And I'm working on finding what my signature is, but I want to emphasize it because the article distinctly says, quote, in the end, 
the chef will keep a couple of heavy hitter dishes and incorporate them into a menu field filled with new ideas. Carrot tartar, yeah, that's absolutely a signature dish. Um, whether or not, like, we may or may not scoff at it as, as, as chefs, but at the same time, when people went, it's super powerful. Like, I remember the meal that I had at Alinea when I was sitting there and I wasn't expecting it because it wasn't on the menu. And all of a sudden they set down the black truffle explosion. And the only thing that I wanted to eat at that dinner was the black truffle explosion. That's the only thing that I wanted to try when I was at Alinea. And it wasn't on the menu. And then all of a sudden they gave it to me. And it's just the feeling that I got in anticipation for that dish and then getting it there was a ton of new stuff that i've never ever thought that i would get but then when i got that dish that brought it back to that grounded it right that was something that like i know what this is and i know what to kind of expect from it and then when you eat it it's just a completely different experience and so for everyone that may or may not be like me who is struggling to think about oh i'm a chef that can cook everything I'm a chef that can kind of do whatever you need me to do. Start to think about what your specialty is and what your signature dish is and combine that, again, the thing that we just talked about where it's kind of like there's a love for, for something or a love for a specific type of cuisine or an ingredient or something. And that can be your, it's your move. It's your signature move. I, I would also like to know what are your thoughts on the new 11 Medicine Park? Has anyone seen photos of the dishes or the new dining room? We've kind of been talking about every new tidbit of news that's happened since it closed. Uh, and of course, it's a very, very hypeable restaurant right now. So it's great to see how the new menu uh, has transpired and actually cover it here again on the show to kind of bring it full circle for you folks. But next up is a little bit of concept change news. This was a very, very clear concept story prior to this. But again, out of New York City, this is a different chef this time. David Chang's Nishi restaurant is going to change, apparently, into an Italian-inspired concept. So the week of October 16th, which is next week, Nishi will officially welcome guests back with a menu of dishes like orecchiette with octopus and broccoli rabe, chichara spaghetti with duck leg agridolce, and fried lobster fra diavolo with chili spaghettoni. I'm looking at the camera because I'm rolling my eyes at it. This to me is super weird as the restaurateur admits to kind of discrepancy and lack of concept focus, saying that they started with all sorts of weird ideas. So David Chang didn't know exactly what it was going to be. When it started, they just kind of went with it. So first they wanted a no tipping restaurant, which flopped, right? They took tips six months after it opened again. <laughs> yeah. Rue Down says, when in trouble, go with an Italian concept. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, that, that, that's been done before. But um, they kind of, then they switched to wanting it to be a Italian meets Korean hybrid. And then they ran into an issue of it being an issue of catering towards the guest where the food was apparently, quote, uh, what a cook wants to cook for a cook or to impress Chef Dave, end quote. As for what this means for Momofuka as a brand, David Chang says, quote, great value, delicious food, cooked in the best way possible with all the proper techniques, end quote. Again, rolling my eyes at the camera because the article even says it. It's a very, very broad mission statement to say that again. I'm going to read it for you again just so you, so you get it. Chang says, the Momofuku as a brand is, quote, a great is great value, delicious food, cooked in the best way possible with all the proper techniques, end quote. Wouldn't any other restaurant or any other mission statement for an establishment be a recipe for failure? I'm not 100% sure I get behind that mission statement because I'm in the process of completing a mission statement for me and my team this week myself, and hearing that doesn't get me inspired at all, right? The dumpling spot down the street is going to do that too, and so is Daniel Hume at 11 Madison Park. So it's definitely... That definitely struck a chord with me. What would be interesting is if they were to brand it into something differently, like a play on Momofuku, like if they called it like, I don't know, throw out some names in the comments where it's kind of like something like Italian, like it has an Italian ring to it, but it's also a Momo something. But I totally get it. Chang sees Italian food as something that's, you know, powerful and comfort food and something that people crave, but he can't make it a Korean style spot because that just doesn't make sense. So to me, I would just hope that he would be honest about that. People's bullshit radars are stronger than ever these days. And if you try to con them, you're going to get found out. 
it just goes back to the point I made earlier about loving it, right? Like if he loves pasta, make pasta, but don't apologize for it. You should just own it. That's just my thoughts. Next up, we've got a story from my alma mater, the Culinary Institute of America, just announced this week that they're going to start to have two optional electives starting in May, uh, one in food photography and one in food styling. Uh, this kind of got blown a little bit out of proportion when everybody started to say that uh, the Culinary Institute of America institutes a Instagram-focused class. But um, the classes will teach students how to work with digital cameras and lighting and how to compose and edit a shot and how to cook for the still camera. So, quote, with the same values that if you were eating it, evoking the feeling that it's going to be luscious. That is from Kirsty Bowser, a food stylist and Institute alumna who is working to develop the courses with Phil Mansfield, a staff photographer at the school. It's an interesting uh criteria for getting hired. So what does that mean? So being attentive to the current state of the market, a photogenic dish is, quote, absolutely, end quote, likelier to stay on the menu. So they are attempting to kind of instill that and make sure that aesthetics are principal for the, the, the students at CIA. So another point that really stood out to me and something that I had to give myself a little bit of a pat on the back for is, quote, the goal of being a restaurant chef and owner is increasingly elusive thanks to competition for top jobs and a stagnant restaurant market. So schools like the Culinary Institute hope to prepare their students for a broader range of careers. In the current job market, an expanded skill set can make the difference between being an employed and still looking, end quote. I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. It is not enough to just serve good food anymore. Michael Lasconis, who is an instructor at the Institute of Culinary Education just down the road in Manhattan, estimates that, quote, maybe only half of the students that he encounters aspire to a career in restaurant kitchens, and he anticipates more curriculum changes in the next five to ten years to reflect that. Now, I personally saw a lot of backlash to the story, uh, some people who went to my school making fun of it, saying that it's just too expensive of a school to have a class like that in. But to me, this is just wrong. That, that kind of um, mindset is wrong. The culinary school that would put the CIA out of business is the one that prepares its students better for the current state of the industry, right? You can't argue with 800 million active users on Instagram, a lot of them getting a lot of pleasure from seeing photos of food. And with the social media landscape changing as fast as it does, it's great to at least see them taking a crack at it. Is it the perfect class? Probably not. Is it the perfect instructors? Absolutely not, because no one is technically quote unquote qualified to teach you how to use Instagram because everyone is still figuring it out, right? The poll feature just came out last week and everyone's still trying to wrap their heads around how to use it best. Um, a great stat that was presented in the article is from that professor estimating that quote, uh, no, we, we mentioned that quote already. Uh, that was from a different professor. Uh, but I personally got much more value from just experimenting myself um, and kind of attempting to find a style of my own with photography. I didn't get the luxury of having be, like being able to take this class, but I shot on film way back in high school. So to someone who has zero photography or food styling experience, I'm just happy that you can go to that school and have it be offered as an option. Right? The program will, of course, continue to grow and evolve with time, but back when the modernist movement was a thing at CIA, they also pioneered a food science major, which was unheard of at the time. So in my opinion, you should evolve and innovate or you're going to die is just kind of the, the punchline. So I'm nothing but supportive of it. If they, can get no, if they can get great people teaching the students, that's even better. Last up is a little bit of a weird story and a kind of a provocative story. Um, while I read a little bit of it, if you have any, if you're here on the live stream and you have any questions you want me to answer or stories that you want me to dive a little bit deeper into, go ahead and leave me a comment. Um, it's a weird story. Again, it's a provocative story that Eater published as an excerpt from a book called, quote, Feed the Resistance, Recipes and Ideas for Getting Involved by Julia Tertian. So I'm going to read you a quote from it. You can kind of see if it's something that you'd like to explore yourself. It's definitely out there and goes into interesting territories, but I've been on the hunt for a way to articulate this because to me, food is an art form that transcends and plays with all five senses, unlike music and painting and stage acting and all of that. So it is an experience that no other art form is able to accomplish. And one of the only ways that you can draw inspiration from something else that brings people pleasure is to reference sex. So here's the quote. 
Food has a promiscuous voyeuristic dimension as well. It can be used and misused as a tool to investigate the multifarious realities that exist outside our bubbles. We can, trans we can traverse temporal, spatial constraints and transcend corporeal phenomena to enter a place we never knew, the experience of the other. This is food as an object of the spirit, food at its best. So if you like that kind of writing, you like those kind of like explorations into comparing food to other art forms, I definitely recommend you read the excerpt from the article or maybe just pick up the whole book and see if you get any uh, valuable information out of it. Um, the other book that I'm thinking of right now is um, A Quintessential Art, I believe it's called, and that is all, also all about food, uh, comparing it to art. It is the closest thing that I've come to to making sure that I can draw comparisons between food and some other industry, and it's very, very interesting. But I always try to find ways to get more inspiration from other industries and make sure that it's constantly in my head. Uh, and this was a great, this was a great piece. The entire article is linked up in the show notes along with everything else I mentioned today. But let's go ahead and get into this week's non-industry story. Unfortunately, that should bleed be uh, Blade Runner 2049 for me. I'm seeing it tonight. I wish that that could have been the story today. I, I wish I could have seen it this weekend, but I was busy. Uh... But today's non-industry story is actually about another movie. It's a trailer that came out, and it looks dope AF, and that's the new Pacific Rim Uprising trailer. And it looks like everything I could have ever wanted it to be. Blade Runner? Yes, man. I, mm, I want to see it really bad. Um, the new Pacific Rim looks a little bit Power Rangers-y, but I'm sure they're going to crush it. I don't think it's going to be that kind of a flop. The monsters look awesome. The... Um, um, robots look fucking awesome. I'm super pumped for it. But this was one of my most uh, pleasant surprises for me in, the, in movie history was the first Pacific Rim. And if I'm not wrong, there was actually a time when they debated whether or not they were going to do a second one. But now that it's a real thing, I'm nothing but pumped. I saw the trailer last night uh, and I got super excited. I was like, that has to be the non-industry show this week. I personally love geeking out to uh, action movies. Uh, that's especially in the theater. That is my zen moment that is my escape i love 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 that so that is something that especially when i was a line cook i would go and do double features at the local movie theater i would buy one ticket and time it out so that it would one movie would end and i could just stay in the theater and then just walk into another theater that's my ad admission of of law breaking for for all of you folks that are that are here so with that this has been episode 34 of the emulsion. Thank you so, so much for listening. A quick little reminder before you take off, if you want to support this or any of the other content I do for as little as $1 per month, that's like less than a side of bacon at a diner. I would love for you to check out my page on Patreon. We made our first goal of $100, so I dropped my first cookbook club series all about Milk Bar by Christina Tosi. It is a near 30-minute breakdown of the book, uh, so that means recipes and stories and dish inspiration all for just a dollar a month that qualifies you for access to those videos. There is a ton of other awesome stuff that goes along with me, you know, you giving me more of your money. I'm doing exclusive live streams and behind the scenes videos. I'm giving some more gear away as well. If you've seen any of my gear videos or come to this channel because of my gear videos, I'm giving some gear away. Uh, so definitely check out all those rewards and I'd sincerely appreciate your support. If you're already here and you are supporting me on that platform, I can't thank you enough. If you have stories that you want covered on next week's show, go ahead and shoot them over to me on Twitter and hashtag the emulsion so I can find them. Subscribe on YouTube if you aren't already. Definitely leave a thumbs up on this video if you enjoyed it or consider leaving a review on iTunes if you listen there. Regardless of where you are, I appreciate your ears. So thank you so much. My name's Justin Kana. Have a good one. Bye folks. Did anybody have any questions on YouTube that you wanted answered? Um, we're not going to get those all the way on the uh, podcast itself, but if there's anyone here, while I take my last sip of cold brew. No? Nothing? Okay, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good rest of your week.